Hello, everyone. My name is Jasmine Simpkins. I am a reporter and host for Hip Hollywood and KTLA, and I'm also a member of AFCA, which means I am a film critic. I watch a lot of film and television. I have a lot of opinions about film and television, but more than anything, I love celebrating the people behind film and television. And today, uh, I have the honor of talking to two beautiful and very, very, very talented women, uh, Miss Melissa Hazlip and Numa Perrier. Uh, these two have created some wonderful projects, things you have heard about, things you have seen, and, and there's so much more to come. So I am going to be quiet and allow them to talk. But more importantly, we are going to be talking about film and um, celebrating Women's History Month and why our stories as women and women of color are so important and why they need to be told. So ladies, I will let you briefly introduce yourselves. Uh, as Gil Robertson said, uh, this will be a conversation really between the two of you to kind of be able to have this one-on-one -on -one conversation about uh, your work, your body of work and things that are to come. I will be here to kind of guide, throw in a couple of things and I'm hearing uh, have you guys expand and elaborate, but it will be a fun um, half hour or more of great conversation. Love it. <laughs> love it. Thank you so much. I love it. I'm so happy to be here with you ladies. Well, Melissa, I'll let you start. Let's do a brief introduction. Okay. Well, I'm Melissa and thank you for the lovely introduction. Actually, I'm so excited to be creating in this space right now. Uh, it feels like there is a window that is open and we have to run through it because I'm not sure when it's going to close. Uh, but my, um, I'm the producer, director, and writer of the film Mr. Soul, which is a documentary that's been out there in the space right now, just premiered on PBS, and we will soon have a streaming um, partner as well. And it's just been a wonderful journey, and I do other work as well. I'm working on a, a series for Netflix, and it's actually very much in keeping with our theme. It's uh, about the history of black womanhood in America. Of course, I should say incomplete history because we're not done. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we just getting started. Right. Uh, the incomplete history of black woman womanhood in America explored through the lens of women in hip hop, their lives and their music. So I'm a co-executive producer on that. It's a four part series for Netflix and we got slowed down by the pandemic, of course, as everyone did. Mm -hmm. So we're just kicking back into gear again. And it's just really wonderful time to be creative and also be mindful of everything we're absorbing in the country and with black women leading right now, having a voice that we can share and, and uplift other black women and with MVP in the White House, <laughs> definitely change the dynamic. And it's yeah. very exciting to be um, recognizing the contributions of women, which have so summarily been dismissed and erased, not just from the public sphere, but from hip hop and from, you know, the contributions that we've made to the culture. So every day is um, a victory in a way, just getting our stories out there. And um, thank you so much for this platform. Of course. <laughs> that was illustrious, yes. <laughs> Uh, well, I'm Numa Perrier. I'm a filmmaker, actor, writer, producer. Um, I've been in this space for a minute, um, but still very much consider myself an emerging artist uh, with my first feature film, Jezebel, that came out um, last year. That's on Netflix now. Um, I feel like that film is a very solid introduction to who I am, my personal history, but also what I want to say as an artist, um, what I care about as an artist, bringing understanding to the misunderstood and centering black women as leads in front and behind the camera. That, that's very important to me um, in everything I do. Um, yeah, I'm happy to be here. I love Melissa. I love your film. I'm excited to see what you do next in the space. And yeah, let's chop it up. Let's talk let's about it. Up. And I didn't get to say how much I love you. You know, we've been friends for a long time and supporting each other's work and each other's journey. And so it's really fun to be able to sit down with you at this point and catch up on everything. 
Yeah, my last memory of you is being at Sundance, of course, in the in the freezing cold as every year. Um, but having you like pull me from the line <laughs> to make sure I got in with you <laughs> uh, for a screening and save, saving me from freezing. <laughs> so that was really nice. But yeah, we've been in the, you know, in the same circle for, for a minute now. So. And it's so exciting. I remember seeing your photo um, in this article at the end of the year about 2020 being a banner year for black women directors. And I was like, yes, there's you. Yeah. And, you know, to share this space with you and so many other black women creatives, you know, it's nice to see us being sort of rounded up, but really we've been out here for a while. You know, the expression black excellence is not a hashtag, like it's innate, mm -hmm. you know, we've always been excellent. And I think yeah. as women, we've always been excellent and always been leading but there just seems to be more of an awareness of that right now. Mm -hmm. so it's, it's absolutely a continuum. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, there's, there's, there's no beginning and no end to, to our excellence or to our expression, you know, to who we are out here creating and making things happen, making things pop. We make all of it pop. So yeah, it's a continuum. I think it's so important. And I want you guys to elaborate a little bit on your relationship because those are so important. And I would imagine even more so in uh, the film and television space, who you know can be so helpful. So kind of talk about the genesis of how you guys even met and uh, where it all began. <laughs> Gosh, I don't even remember where we first met. <laughs> That's how long I think I remember. Far it goes back. I think I Not remember. Sundance. It was another it festival. Was before Sundance. And yeah. I think it may have been um, because you were living in Lamert Park, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I shot a film in the apartment across from you. Oh, with you Jackie. That? Yes. I actually I had to come in and, and knock on your door <laughs> and say, I'm sorry, can I Did borrow you your oven? oven? <laughs> yes. <laughs> He was like, excuse me? Like, you no, were using like, my oh, oven. Right yes. now, can I just borrow your oven for a second? Yeah. We I were, remember now. I, I remember. It and um, we, we, it was very DIY and it was for film independent. And we were in, a, um, in the, the apartment, which looked exactly like Numa's right across the hall. Mm -hmm. But we couldn't use their oven and we had to take a prop piece of bread and for the next scene, the bread was going to be burnt. And so we realized, oh no, we don't have that second loaf of bread that's burnt. We're going to actually have to burn it ourselves. Yeah, so exactly. knock, knock, knock. <laughs> actually, I'm gonna say, if I know the neighbors, so I'll just, you know. <laughs> Typical producer move. I knock on a door oh. and I'm like, I know this is really awkward, but can we borrow your oven? <laughs> I not only borrow your oven but then burn some bread burn some, <laughs> some bread in your house <laughs> yeah, I remember, now. I remember that being time. the most strange but also most common occurrence um you know just using our own home to fil film in using yeah. jackie's across the door jackie stone yeah. who's also oh. a filmmaker um, we were stone. always filming something it was either our side or her side film so it wasn't uncommon to have to meet new people and yeah that is where we <laughs> and you were filming Black <laughs> that, that was the connection but yeah that's where yeah, i think we were connected was, yeah. before that but you were, mm -hmm. you were filming black and sexy in there right yeah so many episodes you yeah. know every corner of that house including jackie's side because uh, we had the full top floor. And when Jackie moved to LA, she just rented out that side from us. And, um, but it was kind of with the loose understanding that we would both use each other's apartments uh, now and then to film something or to get a pickup on something. Or right. um, if she needed a, a, our bathroom looked a very particular way and hers looked a different way. So uh, we were always asking each other, you know, can I come film for a day or a few hours in your place? So it wasn't um, completely uncommon to have you knock on the door and that happened. But the request for the oven and the burning, that was a whole other level. <laughs> I was like, what is happening? <laughs> but, Melissa, please tell me you brought your own bread that you didn't did, also did. borrow bread to burn. Okay. Okay. 
<laughs> it was a, a film about a Latina woman and it was a very specific thing and a, a very specific piece of bread that was used as an offering on um, Dia, de, Dia de los Muertos. And so yes, okay. it had to be for the altar and it had to look a certain way. Right, and right. So, you know, it was very, very specific, but yeah. yeah. I love that story. I love the idea of what you guys were doing and the community you'd already started. You know, this is long before folks really understood. You guys really set the bar in terms of, you know, um, video and the type of series that could be done on your own you know people yeah. think Lisa Ray set the bar with um awkward black girl but you guys were in the space long before that and yeah we I, we, I definitely consider that. you know what we did at black and sexy as very pioneering um you know sure. we learned on the job it was <laughs> you know the the trials and tribulations and the slings and arrows you know we we absorbed all of that but very much at that time we did move to Lamar Park with that intention uh, to build community um, to be a resource mm -hmm. and to also mine the resources of a community that people didn't film in Lamert Park hardly. I mean, there was a generation of filmmakers who did. And right. then there was a gap between like our generation of filmmakers trying to come revive some of that and, you know, start seeing Lamert Park and South LA as part of the landscape of all of the web series that we did and short yeah. films. And, um, and a, a lot of that got carried into what became Insecure, you know, Issa Rae's show um you know films all in that area as well but it was such a great resource for us but also we were part of being the resource um because you could go and make a deal with a mechanic down the street if you needed to sh film something at an auto shop you could make that person-to-person -person deal um, in a way that you would never be able to do in Hollywood, mm -hmm. you know, so the spirit of independent artistry and independent filmmaking was very much supported in Limerick Park and that one, you know, piece of you, we need a piece of burnt bread. Uh, it, it was just part of that mentality like we're here to make things we're here to help people make things and we're here to show a piece of the community that's rarely shown even erased. So I'm uh, really proud of the work. Um, and I'm in West Adams now, um, but really proud of the foothold uh, and the imprint that we made while we were there. It didn't go unnoticed, I would say, as an L.A. native. I, you know, I'm from L.A. I grew up in South L.A., not far from Lamert. My mom used to have an apartment before I was born, but I remember she would talk about how, like, she had the most fabulous apartment because it had these huge picture windows, like, in the front, like, hardwood floors, like, you would never believe. And then as I got a little older, me and my sister were looking for an apartment. We were like, we're going to go to Lamert because this is all we ever heard about. And, and it was a fabulous apartment that we found. So I knew the area too well. So seeing that you both tapped into a community like you said, that people don't didn't know exist because you have a lot of transplants in this city who immediately go to the Valley or they go to Hollywood. And it's like, no, there are black folks here in South LA and it's not all boys in the hood. Like I tell people that all the time, like yeah. that is a movie. That's one part of what this city looks like. Mm -hmm. um, so kudos to both of you guys for even coming into the heart and the soul of the community and making your art. I want to rewind though for a little uh, and go even further back for both of you. Where did your start come from? Like, when did you even have that spark or idea that you wanted to get into filmmaking? <laughs> well, for me, it's, it's from childhood. Um, and I talk about this a lot, how all of the things I was interested in as a kid and what were my escape routes and my ways of expressing myself and understanding myself, I may not have had the names for what all of those things are, were at the time. I may not have had the example of another black woman directing a film for me to know that, oh, this is a, this is a career and life path or even a life purpose for myself. But I was very much doing all of those things. So I was writing from a very young age. I was acting from a very young age six years old, seven years old, eight years old. I was producing from a young age, even the early, early 
family productions of, you know, getting the family together to do a little play to show our parents. I was producing and directing those things, but I would have never called myself a producer or a director. A writer and an actor, yes. I saw examples of that and I saw a career path for that, um, but I had to really kind of piece that together for myself uh, once I arrived in LA and saw, oh, all of these talents and interests that I have make up a filmmaker. That's what I am. That's such a big part of my purpose is to make films and to um, fulfill the things I care about through these films. But yeah, that's how I got my start. Uh, <laughs> it's I very much have learned almost everything on the job and then adding classes into that where I can take a class here and there to to boost up my knowledge um, and my language around all of the different aspects of what I do. Melissa, when did it all get started for you? Well, you know, I come also very similar to Numa from a performing background and a real true love of the arts and, you know, raised up as a dancer, singer, actress, studying with all the grades, thinking I was going to take a career, you know, as a, like an Ailey dancer or dancer of Harlem. Like that was my goal as, as a 16 year old. And then I actually moved into performing and uh, premiered on Broadway and did a lot of theatrical stuff. But mm -hmm. even while I was loving that and being sort of a master technician in on Broadway and doing shows and touring the world, I, also, I always felt like I wanted to speak and tell more of a story. And when you're working in theater, you're at the behest of a larger um, organization, a larger ideal making, you know, whether you're working for Disney or you're working with Gregory Hines or, you know, George Wolf, as I did, there's always a larger vision that you're a part of. And that really spoke to me. Like, how can I be a part of the larger vision making? even though I really enjoyed performing. So I kind of hung up my shoes in the early 2000s after I did Lion King. And I said, now is the time that I'm ready to tell larger stories and sort of shift the energy from performing to creating and really being able to harness these stories that I feel are important. And I started to notice that what was missing for me was the stories of and by and about and amplifying the voices of black women and, and people of color before it was sort of trendy <laughs> to kind of do that. And I thought, well, you know, I have so many stories that I want to tell. Let me align myself with people who are doing the same thing, find my tribe. Mm -hmm. And I started working and helping everyone. Like that was my idea. Let me help. And then as I help, I'll learn. And then after that, I started I first, you know, got to AFI and started working in development there and I would volunteer on every student film and, you know, that constant fit yourself into every job until you've been AD or you've been, you know, PA or you've been casting, whatever it is that you need, you find that pocket. And all the while kind of honing my own stories with ideas, well, I want to tell this one story about my uncle that was always in the back of my mind. Mm -hmm. So, I, and then from there, I basically just jumped into every film or emerging filmmaker type of workshop that I could to sort of hone my skills and again, build community and find my tribe. And it was at Film Independent that I really clicked into that LA scene because they have a, a program called um, Project Involved, which is like an emerging filmmaker um, mentorship and almost like a, a fellowship for a year. And so through that and the Producers Guild diversity and um, the Flaherty, I just kept honing my craft because I didn't go to film school, but I wanted to find a way to build community and sort of fast track to the stories. And yeah, so it all kind of built from there. And I founded my company in 2009 and with the idea of amplifying the voices of um, independent filmmakers and women, especially and people of color entirely. <laughs> <laughs> um, because I realized that, you know, we have to amplify our own voices and have our own stories to tell through our own lens and without apologizing and without waiting for permission, which I felt like was happening in the late 90s, early 2000s. And it wasn't until that shift of, I don't have to wait. And I probably shouldn't because someone might beat me to the punch with my own idea. That, that shift really happened for me in the mid 2000s. And that's when I started developing Mr. Soul 
and started working on, uh, then worked on You're Dead to Me at Film Independence Project Involve and just kept building my resume as I was pulling my tribe together and honing my craft. Ladies, talk about some of the challenges though that you may have faced um, trying to get your stories told. And being that you are a woman and for so long, this has been not necessarily a man's business, but we understand that they are the ones that were getting more of the access, especially uh, white men in this particular space, directors and storytellers. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, you know, um white men can be challenging. <laughs> um, definitely not, not a challenge that we can't overcome. Uh, with Black and Sexy TV, I was really part of a collective and a bubble that rarely interacted with anyone who wasn't Black, you know, in the creative process. And for eight years, it was 99% Black people having the ideas in the writer's room, green lighting the projects, funding the projects, delivering the projects. <laughs> uh, I really created a bubble, you know, and that I loved existing in. And once I ventured out to make my first feature film, it was like, oh, there's a much, <laughs> there's a much bigger world with other, you know, people. I'm trying to, you know, get distribution for my film, get funding for my film, still going to the culture and the community that supported me for so many years, but also having to finally actually, <laughs> actually um, interact with people in positions of power who were not black. That was really kind of a, a flipped process for me um, because I had definitely heard all of the stories, but living inside the world of, you know, black ownership is just, it's absolutely incredible. Um, you still have the same issues and problems, but you don't have the, the lens of racism on top of it and the systems of racism on top of it. So now I'm pretty much feel like I am having to kind of relearn how to move and navigate mm -hmm. the waters of that. Oh, you know, um, I'm not the one giving everything a green light now with the things that I'm looking to do. You know, I'm collaborating with other production companies who the, the makeup of their companies are not 99% black, you know? there is a racial lens and a, a racial barrier in communication, in basic communication. Um, so I don't look at these as insurmountable challenges in any way, um, but I am always definitely comparing it and figuring out how to reconcile, how do you go from ownership and freedom <laughs> to collaboration within a racist system um, and still achieve the goals and the ambitions that I have for myself as a filmmaker. It's a, I am really learning something new about that every single day because I have the absolute reverse experience. Uh, so yeah, not anything that, that I can't surmount, but a real learning curve right now. Melissa, how about for you? Yeah, I, I, I echo Numa's point of the, the learning curve because once you sort of step outside of your bubble and realize that, you know, if you've spent 10 long years, say, as I did working on a project, trying to find ways for people to recognize what, what you're doing is important, usually mm -hmm. because you're trying to get funding, you know, and, and the only approach to that sort of ascribing value is to, to share the work and to say, I'm not looking for you to understand the significance of what I'm saying as a black woman and in the black culture and what I'm presenting. I'm just asking you to recognize that this needs to be done and your funding is imperative. There's two different things. And so what I, this was what I came up against so frequently when people didn't understand or didn't know the content that we were creating, 
And so therefore, because they hadn't ascribed value to it and didn't know about it, it wasn't accessible to them and was not an of course, of course you can have the money or of course we'll fund you or of course we'll collaborate with you. So that was a really interesting journey to recognize, you know, it's not just how much you create and, and how many credits you have or what you're bringing to the table. It's actually getting people on board to recognize what you're doing in the culture. And sometimes that can be where you get the biggest pushback mm -hmm. because you're asking people to align with your sense of innate black excellence, you know? <laughs> like this is not a question for you actually. And it's certainly not a question for us and what we're trying to convey mm -hmm. and in the content we're creating. But when you get into the space of competing, competing for a broadcast date or competing for, you know, uh, funding if you are going the nonprofit route or competing for the best moments to take meetings with other creatives. Mm -hmm. That's when it starts to show up and you realize, oh, okay, I have to, that my blackness and my, my excellence is something I'm already comfortable with. Mm -hmm. And it's, why do I have to keep reintroducing this to other people? And that's when you start to feel the friction. And um, it's just as much a journey for them and the rest of the world right now, opening up to the realization of, you know, the contributions of black women, not just in the history of this country, but in the, in the culture and what we create is, is really significant, but it's been overlooked and it's been erased. So we're sort of fighting that as well. It's like, you may not know about it just because you have been thinking about it, but you know, mm -hmm. folks have really woken up since last uh, summer and the events of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud, Ahmaud Aubrey, but it's not enough, you know, it's not enough for the dialogue to, it's not a free pass. In other words, they're not woke enough, you know? And so one burden that we carry, I think, is trying to always convey the importance of blackness. And as, as black women, naturally we are leading and we're leading with that. And um, that can be exhausting sometimes. And to that point, because you know that you're in an industry where you have to constantly educate people about the art that you're creating, um, why is it ever more important for you guys to continue doing what you're doing, but also create content that really speaks to the experience of Black women? Numa, I'll let you start. <laughs> I mean, it's important to me because I feel like if I don't do, I mean, I know that if I don't make the films that I'm inspired to create, that no one else is going to make those films. Yeah. And those films will speak to a certain pocket of Black women, um, maybe a small pocket, maybe a, a large pocket, <laughs> maybe many different, ma many different pockets, but um, it's important to me that that communication happens. I consider all of the films and all of the projects I do as, you know, forms of mass communication, uh, you know, with, with whoever is watching them. And I think that um, part of Black women not being ignored is having films that speak to us. Not, and when, there, when those films don't exist, it, it equals being ignored and being erased. So, for me, that is, I just feel it's just part of my calling to do, you know, I, I'm called to do it. I'm excited to do it. It's the first, you know, layer of importance to me. Um, and, you know, through this, you know, learning curve that I'm going through, you know, I'm just learning how to identify allies versus politicians. Mm -hmm. um, and even in myself, you know, when is the time for me to behave politically when it's a time for me to actually be a deeper ally to someone um or you know as part of moving something forward so yeah for me it, it's just it's always going to be important you know starting from just wanting to understand myself as a black woman and that echoing out and rippling all the way through you know as many black women as i can reach um, 
Yeah, there's really, to me, nothing more important. I feel like when we're good, it's like when they say, you know, like, happy wife, happy life, you know, like, I, that's how I feel about, like, Black women as a whole. Like, if we're good, if we're happy, if we're getting to be playful and free and all of who we are, then the entire world is better for it. Um, and I'll that's my hill, you know, like <laughs> I will always ride for that. Yeah, totally ride for that. And also I think that people are starting to recognize, you know, after what happened in Georgia and, and the way black women vote and the way black women lift up all boats, you know, we are the tide that raises all boats. Mm -hmm. We collectively always want the greater good. Right, we want the greater good for the country, for our people, for our children, for the environment. We vote that way, we live that way, you know, not just as creatives, but as people. And I think if, you know, if the future were a woman, it would have all of that sensitivity. <laughs> you know, it would have the sensitivity of, of what's happening with our planet and saving that. It would have the nurturing around the best lives for our children and democratizing you know, their, their education, making sure all children of color have computers and sort of the, you know, making sure that everybody is well. That is the nurturing um, vibe in black women innately, I think. And it excites me so much that people are finally starting to realize that, you know, after what Stacey Abrams led in Georgia and um, understanding that the power of the black woman's vote, but what we're voting for and, and that greater good that that represents. You know, we would have a future that would be kind to immigrants and kind to, um, you know, food deserts and like all the issues that we deal with one-on-one -on -one trying to raise our families and, 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 and create equality in the world. That, all filters down into our art as well. And so it's a different energy behind the art of black women. And um, it's an inclusive energy, of course. Who sets the bar? You know, Ava DuVernay, of course, this idea of inclusion and making sure that all black women are on her crew and, you know, with what she's doing at Queen Sugar, but that should not be a surprise. It just should be normal yeah. because that's right. And the idea of giving opportunity is right. It just hasn't happened before. And I yeah. think black women are always thinking that way. We are always thinking what's right and what's good. It just hasn't happened before or the opportunities haven't been made before. So we're not just about opening that door and getting through that door, but we're making sure other people are coming through that door with us. You know, it's not about just getting through. You're, you're reaching back to find the people that need to get through too. And when we reach a certain level of, uh, I'm not gonna say fame, but comfort, or maybe it's, um, you know, creative freedom, if there is, ever is such a thing, <laughs> it's this idea of, well, how can I help others? How can I be the example of what was there when I needed it? You know, that, that's my motto even as I get through one door or the next or my meetings or whatever it is that is the larger step up or the glow up, it's about, yes, but how can I be that model for someone who I needed when I was looking around, you know? So it's always that almost like a double consciousness, a dual consciousness that we have already as black people in America and understanding that we are lifting everyone up with us, which is a unique trait, I think that is very specific to black women. It's exhausting, but it's real. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Who, for both of you guys, inspires you, women? And it doesn't have to be other women in the space, but where do you draw inspiration from? I'm sure as creatives, you find a spark in a lot of different places. I mean, even the art that we were talking about that's behind you, Melissa. Um, who are some of the black women that just really give you uh, inspiration and you draw from? Well, it's, it's great uh, <laughs> that you mentioned that because for me, a lot of my early inspirations and even now have been women in the art world, art, Black women, artists in the visual art space, um, like Carrie Mae Weems, um, her photography and films and all of the multimedia art that she does 
is wildly inspirational to me. Um, sometimes I'll just go and search through her, just interviews with her just to get a kernel of, of something amazing. Um, and, you know, she's been working in the space for a long time with recognition, with wider recognition only happening more, you know, in her later career. Um, same thing for Kara Walker, uh, Louise Bourgeois, who's not a black woman, but uh, very much uh, has been an inspiration to me with the multimedia approach uh, to her artistry. Um, in the literary space, Roxane Gay is an inspiration. Um, really women in these spaces who their voices are so strong and honest and you know with that really healthy dose of not giving a fuck uh i'm always taking a page from that always inspired by that and just you know their sheer approach to the the bodies of black women i'm interested in that and what they do in those spaces um not so much louise but uh carrie and and kara um yeah that's those are, those are women that I'm deeply inspired by. And I would love to see them all make feature films <laughs> if they felt called to do so. I would love to see some of these artists uh, get behind the camera in that way. Melissa, who for you inspires you? Yeah. That was a great list. I kind of want was. I want to co-sign on that list. <laughs> um, and so fantastic. And there are others too. Um, I, in the art world, as you said, the woman behind me, the artist, uh, was very, very special and important to me. And her name is uh, Fabiola Jean-Louis. And I really love what she's doing. Uh, this series called... Um, uh, the series where she's putting, it's called Rewriting History and putting women back, Black women specifically, back in the narrative where they've been removed from the art history or the Renaissance era, different um, settings. Mm -hmm. I think what she's doing is dynamic. I'm really inspired by women, like I'm working with Hannah Beekler at the moment on my Netflix series. And just her un- an unprecedented, you know, brilliant mind and calling from so many diasporic textiles and images and, and the beauty that she imbues in her work and the creativity. What she did with Black Panther is extraordinary and what she continues to do and how she sort of visualizes us um, in a way that is beyond um, just beyond the imagination. I love that. I love seeing that kind of work. I love what Ava's doing. I love what uh, Lena Waithe is doing in the space and how she is creating so much content for um, you know, LGBTQ folks and uh, queer people of color, particularly creating the most important work and opportunities out there. I think that's really significant. Uh, and I'm just really inspired by any filmmakers who are out there doing it, whether they're known or unknown. It's so hard to create work right now and especially to be creative in the midst of this pandemic post pre or you know, whatever it's gonna be, whatever the new dynamic is because the landscape of, of creativity is changing and pivoting along with this unknown future we have for you know, the landing of cinema and whether it will be in the virtual space or if we're, we'll ever sit in a, a theater again. So I'm very inspired by the women who are leading those spaces and all the incredible directors who uh, hit, the, hit the ground running last year and this year. Um, uh, Garrett Bradley, what she's done. And there's just so many people and women particularly reimagining themselves on this American cinematic landscape. And it's a continual um, inspiration for me and literary as well. Uh, Sarah Elizabeth Lewis and what she's doing and uh, at Harvard and also with her um, vision and justice project. So I could go on and on, <laughs> but it's just really exciting to be part of what I feel like is a sisterhood and what, even if it's invisible, there are these threads and ties that bind our work together and our lives together. I feel like we're always rooting for each other and that we understand that there's no room to tear down, that there's 
plenty of tearing down happening in the world and certainly in our last administration. Now it's like a recovery and a build back, you mm -hmm. know, and we build, that's what we do. We build in black culture and um, especially for women. So I'm just happy to be a part of that. And I see, I see people soaring like that. I love Lisa Cortez and, and the work she does in the space and uh, working with um, uh, so many different incredible topics. I, I literally could be here all day, just, you know, <laughs> caping for my incredible colleagues and the people that I admire. You know, I spend more time liking everyone's work than probably doing that. my own, but it's yeah. because it's part of the visions. It's part of the, the, the quest, right? It's part of the dream board, seeing what other women are doing, amplifying that, and, and for me and my work, you know, speaks specifically to at the intersection of, you know, racial justice, social justice, women's um, amplification, and also, um, you know, liberation. And um, everything I do is about that anyway. And it's, it, when I see other people doing the same, it really, really inspires me. Ladies, lastly, and this is a two part question. Um, Talk about what projects you do have coming out that perhaps you're excited about. And also, because this is a month where we will be celebrating other women, is there a woman in history that you like to tell her story? And I think, um, uh, you know, if it, even if it's something that you don't have in the works yet, maybe if it's a thought you've had about a specific woman in history you'd like to uh, do a project about. So we will start with you, Numa. Yes. Uh... <laughs> What I have coming up next, I signed on to direct my first studio film for Netflix. Um, it's a love story starring Gabrielle Union and Keith Powers and uh, one other actor who I can't um, announce yet, but it's basically a love triangle between an older woman, a younger man, and his mother. <laughs> oh, so <it's> good. Wow. <laughs> Hang on. Messy, it's a good, messy, uh, romantic, hilarious fiasco based on a book called The Perfect Find. So um, we've had a couple of pushes due to pandemic, but we're looking to film this summer in New York. So extremely excited about that. Um, and there are a lot of women in history whose stories I would love to dive into. One would be Audre Lorde mm -hmm. um, is, a, is a story that I would love to tell that I'm working towards being able to tell in some capacity um, and others, but you know, uh, hers is the, the passion project kind of on top of my list uh, to find a way to show the world um, who she was. How about you, Melissa? Well, I am so excited to be getting going on the hip hop project for Netflix. And, you know, we sort of stalled out, as I said, for a year due to the pandemic and working from home. Um, so that's gonna take up most of my year and the fall. And I'm really excited to be, in, you know, interviewing all these great hip hop OGs and the new generation of women I think the stories have changed significantly since when we first started out to tell this to tell this um, this story. So that's going to be very exciting, especially the way Megan The Stallion is changing the game. And there's it's just a new day for Black women in hip hop. Uh, so that's happening. And then I'm I also signed on to uh, to co-direct a film about Earth, Wind, and Fire. So that's a dream job for me. <laughs> I'm a bit of a music nerd and I love Earth Wind Fire, you know, mm -hmm. beyond I, I, I don't know how I'm gonna pick myself up off the phone <laughs> today because it's just kind of a dream job. So that I'm we're that hasn't been announced yet, but I'm very excited to say that's in the works. I'm also working on some other projects around the Mr. Soul theme and developing stories, possibly taking Ellis Hazlip as the character from the documentary and building out the, a story into a narrative about him. So we're in talks about that. There's so many sort of waterfall projects that come off of 
this sort of soul theme that I've been mining for the last decade. So taking a lot of meetings on that and um, I'm uh, really excited about the possibilities there of working with really expanding, not just the content, but all of this information around the artists and what was happening during that time. Yeah. And I have never directed, by the way, a feature. So, you know, this is, this is a very exciting time for me as I'm developing this story and thinking about how that's going to work. Well, there is this one person that I'm absolutely in love with. And I had the pleasure of working with her and meeting her, interviewing for her for our film. And that is Kathleen Cleaver. And I'm kind of surprised that nobody has been, and this is, goes against what I said earlier about waiting and waiting for permission. I always thought that somebody would do a, a special or um, a documentary or kind of like a, a personal story about Kathleen. And it hasn't happened yet. I had the pleasure of interviewing her for our film, Mr. Soul. And I became like her ambassador for several weeks and then throughout the year. And I flew her back to LA for our premiere at the LA Film Festival. And I just realized how important she is in the story of Black liberation. But she always kind of comes underneath her husband, Eldridge Cleaver. Mm -hmm. And when I met her and when I spent time with her in her home in Atlanta, that's when it really hit me. She took me upstairs to her office which was covered with memorabilia and ephemera from the Black Power Movement. And it's hard to even say that because it sounds like you, know, you were a tourist at that time, but she wasn't. She, it's not like she had souvenirs. It's like she had lived this extraordinary life. And I asked her very point blank, Kathleen, who's telling your story? Because it has to be somebody who really is nuanced in, in, in what, it, uh, what your con understanding what your contributions were to the movement and how we can learn from them going forward. And she said that she had started writing an autobiography. And I thought, but there's, you know, there's so much visual around Kathleen mm -hmm. that it, when we think about her and her badass Afro and her black shades and her mm -hmm. leather coat and how she stood out, you know, we know that story, but we don't know her. And I'll never forget, she handed me a chapter of her uh, autobiography. And I was like, oh, look, I, I, I don't even deserve this. But then I thought, wait a minute, I'm going to hold on to it. Because maybe <laughs> in a few years, I can come back and say, remember that chapter you handed me? I've got a treatment now. Mm -hmm. and, and this is time to tell your story. And I haven't heard from her in a couple of uh, a couple of months, almost a year, and I'm getting a little nervous because I haven't heard where she is or how she's doing. So it's really important to tell her story, I think, now more than ever. Ladies, thank you so much. This has been such a spirited and, and well-rounded and amazing conversation. I'm so happy that you took your time out on this Saturday afternoon <laughs> to chat with me. I loved project watching the projects that you guys have done. Jezebel was so amazing and so Great. And that was my second or third time actually watching it since it came out. And I loved revisiting it, getting ready for this. Mr. Soul is so beautiful and so well done. Um, loved, loved watching that. Every single minute of it was so great and informative. So my takeaway from all of this is that you two are brilliant and amazing. I hope to talk to you more with more work that you put out and thank you for what you do. And I celebrate you on today as we continue to celebrate more William, women this month uh, during Women's History Month. Uh, thank you for everyone who's been watching. I'm Jasmine Simpkins in conversation with Melissa Hazlip and Numa Perrier. Thank you, ladies. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.